be our high fashion car. Throughout history, there have been many great American legacies. The space program, the internet, McDonald's, and of course, the mother effing Corvette. The American Chariot of Retirement. A brand new red Corvette in your driveway is proof that your lifetime dedication to hard work was worth it. The Chevy Corvette is a symbol of America that pumps blood through your veins with its guttural V8 roar. And its history is cemented in American tradition. The Corvette has been with us through our triumphs, through our greatest hardships, and hundreds of little wins along the way. As ubiquitous as the hamburger, the Corvette is probably the only sports car your boring ass old grandmother can name. From Barbie to the president, the Corvette is America. And the Corvette is freedom. But freedom isn't free. Like democracy itself, the Corvette's very existence is always teetering on the brink of failure. Watered down by stuffy suits, budgets cut by out-of-touch accountants, and constantly threatened by the Italian, German, and Japanese competitors, in the early 90s, the Corvette faced its hardest trial yet. But in that darkest hour, a brave group of madmen, true believers in the power of the American supercar, picked up their wrenches, strapped on their gloves, and got to work in secret. Die-hard devotees to the cult of horsepower. Proud, card-holding members of the I Can't Drive 55 Club. These brave few toiled in the dark to save one of America's greatest icons. The Chevy Corvette. In 1953, the first Corvette was revealed to the world. It was America's attempt to build a European sports car with beautiful, shapely lines, rear-wheel drive, and an all-American power plant under the hood. It was one of the most significant cars to come out of the 50s, and it kinda sucked. Look, those of us from the Easy Cheese Empire only understand big power and straight lines. The European idea of a lightweight mountain coupe with a penchant for carving apexes wasn't really our vibe. And while the C1 did have most of the right ingredients, the main problem was it had an anemic inline six. And this was back in the 50s, an era of massive V8s. This decision to go with a six cylinder meant that it would be destined to be another weird forgotten car, not a sought after American legend. Thankfully, after designer Harley Earl built the car in secret, it found its way into the hands of Zora Arkas Dontov. Zora knew how to save the Corvette. He swapped out that weak ass inline six for Chevy's golden child, the small block V8, and doing so saved the Corvette from obscurity. From that point in 1955 on, the Corvette was the American benchmark, mostly because it was cheap, at least compared to the British cars World War II vets were importing. Now, with that V8, it had the performance chops to back it up, and it looked really damn good. The C1 evolved in the C2, the Stingray, with bigger engine options, a more aerodynamic design, and prolific use in racing. After that came the Mako Shark-inspired C3, and in the beginning, everything was good. Then, and I swear I mention this in every single video, the oil crisis ruined the fun. You know the story, blah blah blah, cars sucked. And that included the now incredibly choked down, less than 200 horsepower from a V8, Chevy Corvette. As the malaise era ended, Chevy needed to prove they could still build a sports car. Their engineers redesigned the car from the ground up, focusing on lightness over raw power, handling over straight line speed, and some of the best brakes you could get in an American sled, which wasn't really saying much. What they had created was the darling of the American 80s, 
the C4 Corvette. Maximum lateral acceleration. Only one of these cars can hold the road at 0.91 Gs. It isn't Porsche 928S. It isn't Ferrari 308 GTSI. It's the Chevrolet Corvette. That's what it takes to be a new world-class champion. Chevy's new C4 Corvette was a massive leap forward, and it sold like pink sauce. Here now was this growling V8 under a beautiful streamlined fiberglass hood, a car that unlike its American muscle car contemporaries, could absolutely go around a track with left and right turns. It was a true return to American form. The Viper hadn't even been hatched yet, and Ford was too busy fiddling around with four-cylinder Mustangs. The only place you could find similar performance was from Porsche, but you were an average blue-collar Bud Light drinking American worker. You couldn't afford no Porsche, and you didn't trust no damn Germans. Hard-working Americans could toil away at the local hamburger mine, save up a bit, and afford a Corvette. And they did. In 1984, more than 50,000 fiberglass C4s were sold. That's more than the total number of Mark II Supras sold in the US, period. But unlike the Corvette, the Supra got faster and faster. So did the Z and the 911. The C4 Corvette had justifiably painted a giant target on its back. And thanks to low cost and high performance, every car company in Japan wanted to build the next Corvette killer. With that growing competition and global financial woes, the Corvette sales numbers slid down a dirty hill every year. By the time the 1990s rolled around, barely 20,000 Corvettes were being sold per year, which was a dismal number by GM standards. Then in 1992, facing bankruptcy, Lloyd Royce, GM's president, slit the throat of their prodigal son. The next generation Corvette, which was gonna be launched in 1993 on the 40th anniversary of the name, had its budget removed from the spreadsheets. Royce directed the company to focus on Pontiac instead, because he believed Pontiac was gonna carry the brand into the future? It's insane. A sports car with a heritage decades old, sent to an early grave to save the Bonneville? Thankfully though, a man by the name of Joe Spielman, who was the head of the division that just had its budget cut, had a different idea of what the future might look like. We don't know what it is. Get him down here. What the hell is going on? Enhance that. Does anybody have any idea what this is? I do. It's the next vet. Get me one. Now our boy Joe Spielman isn't the hero you'd expect in this story. He wasn't your typical blue collar GM employee. He was a Harvard educated numbers guy. But if you stabbed him, gasoline would pour from the wound. While Joe was in college, he saved up enough money working odd jobs to buy his first of many Corvettes and eventually found himself as the head of medium cars manufacturing at General Motors. In the late eighties, he got his dream. He was excited to be part of the new Corvette project. Together with the newly appointed head of Corvette Engineering, Dave Hill, he had been hard at work at the next generation of Corvette when that Axeman came knocking. But rather than give up and scrap the project, Joel and Dave rolled everything they were working on into a forgotten warehouse, far out of the sight of the executives. For backup, they called Jim Perkins. In the 1960s, Perkins had failed to get a job with GM. He had interviewed for a low-level position, and the interview went so poorly they didn't even call him back. But like Horatio Pagani did with Lamborghini, Jim showed up anyway. So in a show of good faith, they handed him a broom and told him to get to work. Jim quickly worked his way up to general manager before leaving GM entirely to go work on launching some weird new brand called Lexus. He couldn't stay away for long though. He would return to GM in the late 80s with a new job title. And when he got the call from Joel that the Corvette had been axed, he was devastated. But once he heard that they had kept the prototype and were storing it out of sight, devastation turned into motivation. Perkins started looking at all of his budgets and noticed he had a lot of money to spend on advertising. He figured that, hey, a really fast car is its own marketing. So he started allocating those funds to help Hill and Spielman continue developing the Corvette in secret. As Perkins scrapped together some extra cash, Spielman brought on Russ McLean, Russ was at the time working in Mexico, making production lines run smoothly. He knew how to cut corners to make a budget work. 
Together, Perkins, Spielman, and McLean figured out how to fund an entire development project using leftover money and working off the clock. All they needed was a million here, a million there, and for no one to ask any questions. Because if the executives found out what they were doing, it would likely end the careers of everyone involved. So during the middle of the night, on days off, and while no one was looking, these devoted four continued to design the ultimate Corvette. The first rumors began circulating that a new Chevrolet Corvette was in the works, and they were true. This Corvette was expected to be the bionic man of sports cars. Tucked away in secret in that little shed, Hill and his team pieced together three magic ingredients. First, they built a hydroformed steel frame. What the hell is hydroformed steel? I had to look it up. Think of a crumpled water bottle, but instead of plastic, it's steel. You stick it inside of something, you fill it with water and watch it expand into shape. For engineers, it's like porn, because high pressure forces are evenly distributed throughout the metal shape, making it strong and also lightweight. Essentially, by making steel balloon animals, the team made ultra-strong, flexible, lightweight frames. And then attached to the back of that frame was the transaxle. Look, the journey to the mid-engine Corvette is long, sordid, and weird, and I'll probably tell the whole tale someday. But this step of moving the transmission from the front to the back was a giant step forward. By separating the weight of the engine and transmission, this new Corvette would have that coveted 50-50 weight distribution. The final piece of the puzzle was one of the most important things GM ever developed, a pushrod eight-piston evolution of the small block engines they developed in the Stone Age, redesigned from the ground up using modern building practices and called the LS-1. You've definitely heard of it. Every resto mod, every kit car, hell, every time someone blows an engine in any kind of sports car, the LS1 is the engine that replaces it. Its push rod design keeps it compact. The simplicity of the small block design makes it approachable, and the inherent balance of the V8 makes it perfect for tuning and adding bolt-on performance. The simple, powerful magic of the LS engine has made it the de facto choice of dragsters, kit cars, and even supercars. With those three ingredients, the team had cooked a perfect meal. All they had to do was make sure they all worked together. In the Arizona desert, dressed in generic t-shirts and jeans to avoid suspicion, a group of men pushed a car off a trailer. From a distance, it just looked like a C4 Corvette that had been in a crash. The body panels didn't fit quite right. The wheels stuck out from the fenders like someone made an amateur mistake. But under that ill-fitting body was a trans-axled, hydroformed, LS-powered C5. Jim Perkins made sure that he was the first one to drive it around. Immediately, he recognized that they had made something special. Those four boys had created one hell of a car in that little old shed. Confident from feeling the new C5 drive on a road, Jim Perkins went to a meeting with the heads of GM. In his briefcase, he carried a secret weapon. 800 magazine covers, each adorned with America's sports car. Every previous generation of Corvette, shining examples of the power of the emblem, adorned across glossy pages for decades. 800 exhibits of evidence that showed those stuffy heads of GM that the Corvette was important. That automobile enthusiasts and common people alike adore the V8 tire shredder that GM's legacy was built on. Armed with his briefcase, Perkins looked Lloyd Royce in the eye and said that the Corvette was an American icon that they had no right to cancel. And it worked. The C5 team received the blessing to continue developing their Corvette. They ripped that ill-fitting C4 body off their mule and attached a fiberglass shell that had been designed by John Cafaro all the way back in 1988, when the C5 was first announced. A beautiful wind tunnel-inspired design that was meant to be the modern take on the C2 and the C4. It was a combination of all of the Corvette's best features, and it would slip through the air effortlessly. In 1997, the United States and the world got their first taste of the LS engine. Four years after it was originally slated for release, an American icon made in secret, saved by a ragtag team, finally met its adoring, waiting public. This was the new Corvette, and this was the best Corvette.
the official car of your dreams. If you ask the engineers behind the C5, they'll tell you that it was 250% better than the C4. It was faster, lighter, handled better, and of course, had that LSV8 under the hood. I mean, hell, it was even practical. Thanks to Dave Hill's focus on lightness, that 345 horsepower V8 barely had to try to push the C5 down the road, meaning it got decent gas mileage. It even had luggage space. The American public bought C5 vets faster than GM could produce them. In classic Chevy style, every year there was a new flavor, convertible, 50th anniversary, and the ultimate C5, the Z06. A trim they hadn't used since the C2 way back in the early 60s. Now a staple of the Corvette brand, the Z06 was lighter, only available with a manual six-speed transmission, and it breathed out 400 beer-drinking, hot-dog-eating horsepower. Most importantly though, the greatest thing the C5 ever did was serve as an excellent base for the sixth generation. You see, the C5 was a ground-up redesign of the Corvette, but like your favorite Bethesda game, it had a lot of bugs. The following C6 was the patched and polished version of the C5. Shorter, wider, and more powerful. It shared most of the same components and styling cues, except for one notable feature. The C5 Corvette was to be the last production vehicle to have pop-up headlights, since they were outlawed in the States during the time it was on sale. The new C6 would have fixed lamps, and I'm sure some people were upset by that, even wrote songs about it. Or maybe they just hated good visibility and aerodynamics. Either way, the C6 was known as the last 10%. Dave Hill, engineer for both the fifth and sixth generation, liked to use percentages to describe everything. The C5 was 250% better than the C4, and when the C5 was coming to the end, he said that it was 90% of the way to being a perfect touring car, and the C6 would be that final 10%. With its 400 horsepower of that new generation of LS motor, the confusingly named follow-up to the LS6, the LS2, sat atop much improved suspension. The performance of the C6 made the world take notice. Now, unfortunately, what they first noticed was that ugly interior swathed in plastic and cheap materials, also known as classic General Motors styling. But very quickly after that, they noticed that it was actually really damn fast. The C6 could even nip at the heels of a Lamborghini Gallardo. And most importantly, it cost half of what a Porsche 911 cost. Dollar for dollar, you could not get better performance than a C6 Corvette. And honestly, that's kind of true to this day. That is the beauty of a Corvette. It's the democratization of horsepower. Now, the C5 and C6 were wildly successful, and thanks to the price, everyone now could afford to own a slice of the American dream. But its successes did not end there. Now having conquered the American showroom, the Corvette team sought to conquer the world of racing. Dramatically quipped sweeps here. The great rumbling Corvette engine thundering across the line one more time. Decades earlier, in 1972, Bob Johnson and Dave Hines raced a C3 Corvette in the 24 hours of Le Mans, finishing 15th overall. Sure, it wasn't a win, but it was an incredible achievement from an American brand so far from home. But then, for decades, there was nothing. For so long, GM's shining sports cars stayed stateside, until a yellow, roaring C5 was seen hurtling down the Mulsanne in 1999. After nearly four decades, the Corvette had returned to Le Mans. Two years later, C5s took home a 1-2 finish, and then again in 2002, and then again in 2004, ripping victory away from bespoke cars like the Saline S7 and the Viper, and stepping on the neck of Italy's favorite bratty little child, Ferrari. In 2005, the C6R took over where the C5 began. So fittingly American, the C6R was the loudest car on the track, but its bark was backed up by pure bite. The C6R was a force to be reckoned with, and in its debut year finished 1-2 at Le Mans. The following year, in 2006, the Corvette would stand again at the top, when in the final hours they pulled ahead of Aston Martin to score another Le Mans victory. In the end, before being replaced by the newly updated C7R, the C5 and C6 scored seven first place finishes in France and 10 victories in the American Le Mans series, making it one of the most successful GT cars to ever touch rubber to tarmac. 
a pretty incredible achievement for a car that was never meant to be. On paper, the newly born C5 Corvette was dumb. A big, wide, impractical sports car made of sloppy parts and sold for cheap. Its grip on the earth was managed by caveman suspension. The Corvette should not have handled. It was made of steel and plastic when others were using carbon fiber. The Corvette should not have worked. It was motivated by a simple pushrod V8 while Italy's best cars screamed around racetracks in flat plane crank V8s. The Corvette should not have performed. Proper fast cars had their power plants sat over the back axle. The Stone Age Corvette had its V8 sitting in front of its driver. The Corvette should not have been competitive. And yet, once the C5 generation Corvette made its appearance at showrooms and racetracks, none of that mattered. Because the Corvette was American. Sure, easy to make fun of, comprised of disparate parts, and falling behind what everyone else in the world is doing, but still the fucking best. Today, the Corvette has ascended to proper supercar status with bleeding edge technology and out of this world design. But one cannot forget that 40 years ago, a team of dedicated gearheads risked their entire careers to keep that dream alive. Perkins had said that the Corvette was too important to lose, and he was right. From its birth as an underpowered ragtop, to its current status as the road-destroying mid-engine supercar, the Corvette has, and will likely continue to be, a part of us. This is a nightmare! This is the battle for the lead! The two Corvettes going side by side there! Proof that we Americans can build a proper sports car. We can do it faster, we can do it simpler, and we can do it cheaper. Our most resolute example that American motorheads will stare the world's finest car makers in the face, squint, rub their chins, and spit, and build a car our own damn way. The right way. Because no one on God's green earth can tell us otherwise. Well done, fat man from Kentucky. This is a masterpiece.